to thank to our speakers that came from abroad to share, discuss, and highlight the key points and trends of tourism. Just to contextualize, HIPTUR is a network of public institutions of polytechnic higher education with tourism, hospitality, and restaurant courses. The main objective is to articulate, encourage, and promote formative, educational, scientific, and cultural activities, in addition to the promotion of research in the area of tourism and integrate 17 public polytechnic higher education institutions. It is really a privilege for all, for all of us to host you in our school. I sincerely hope to all enjoy the next exposition, debates, and networking. Thank you very much for your presence. Agora, Agora sim, português, muito rapidamente. rapidamente. É com, é com muita honra e orgulho que faço a abertura deste terceiro webinar de RIPTUR. Antes de fazer uma breve apresentação da RIPTUR e do seu propósito, gostaria de agradecer às oradoras que nos honram com as suas apresentações. Agradecer à Comissão de Organização deste webinar, na pessoa da pessoa da doutora Coretti e Silva. Mas, Mas afinal, o que é isto a RIPTUR? É uma rede de instituições públicas do ensino superior politécnico, concurso de turismo, hotelaria e restauração. O seu principal objetivo passa pela articulação, incentivo e promoção de atividades de índole formativa, educacional, científica e cultural, além do fomento da investigação na área de turismo. Integra 17 instituições do ensino superior politécnico público, distribuídas pelo território nacional e assenta em três fatores claros. O alinhamento claro em torno das opções estratégicas para potenciar o desenvolvimento do setor, o reconhecimento do papel crucial que a formação tem na, na, na valorização dos nossos recursos humanos, tão, numa área tão importante tanto como esta, a consideração que os politécnicos como cursos de turismo congregam objetivos de, de áreas de interesse comum, o que implica o reconhecimento das vantagens decorrentes de uma atuação concertada e, e cooperativa. De uma forma simplista, podemos afirmar que é indubitável que juntos somos mais fortes. A RIPTUR trabalha com todos e para todos o turismo. Contem com a RIPTUR para trabalharmos em prol do turismo nacional. E desejo a todos uma boa sessão. Good afternoon to all of those here in the room and to those who are attending online. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank again the joint organization and colleagues and friends from IPP who are actually were uh, fundamental to be able to implement this joint event hybrid, um, putting together IPP, IPVC and the project Cold Sense. Uh, the IPVC has accepted the challenge uh, of RIP Tour to launch a webinar. And the, one of the moments that seems very appropriate was the fact that we are um, partners in a research project, in Erasmus project, that Lenya Marx here presented here with us will present in a minute. Uh, so I will just uh, tell you who is actually joining us for this webinar very briefly, and they will then do their own presentations and their own um, contributions. The Cold Sense process project brings today Lenya Marx, and she's the leader of the project. And this project, uh, she will explain in more detail from Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Then we will have Sylvia Ole presenting a case study from University of Girona together. She prepared with Guillermo Ferrer, a colleague also from Girona. And finally, we will have Peter Björklut from Turku University in Finland. And he also present a case study um, these case studies are part of one of our outputs, an ebook that you will probably be in some information being disseminated through this webinar's invitation. But Lenya will refresh our memories of where we can find it uh, in a Cold Sense website. It's a very interesting and useful tool for our research and education processes mostly concerning the creating cultural understanding through travel. So thank you again for hosting and we would like to welcome our speakers. Boa tarde a todos e a todas e sejam muito bem-vindos. É um prazer, e vou começar em português para depois seguir em inglês, é um prazer estar aqui, falar na minha própria língua uh, e falar-vos de um projeto que uh, 
nos tem ocupado por tanto tempo, com muita paixão. And now also for those at home following us, uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about this project that we are so passionate about. So um, <clears throat> let me... It's uh, not working, apparently, the presentation. Maybe we can change into presentation mode. Um, <clears throat> our project is called Cult Sense, sensitizing young travelers for local cultures. And it's an Erasmus Plus project, um, and we are different universities. And the idea is to work with people like you, and also colleagues like people at the UPP and others in order to increase the uh, understanding between cultures and increase the levels of quality of relationship between hosts and visitors. One of the motivations um, <clears throat> or better, what are the motivations that led us to talk about this project? First of all, how many of you have visited Amsterdam? Show of hands. Yeah, maybe at home you can also uh, think if you have visited Amsterdam. How many of you have visited the red light district? Many of you who have visited Amsterdam. This is a picture of the red light district uh, in Amsterdam. And you can see that there's many, many, many people, especially in the evening. And what happens is, have you thought of the people living there? Because there are people living there. It's not just for tourists. Um, how is it to live there? And how is, for example, being a woman living in that place? Uh, and what are the challenges that a lot of tourists, it's, it's uh, really very crowded. Um, do tourists really understand that people live there? Do people living there understand what tourists are looking for? So there's many, many questions. This is an extreme case, but this is the kind of thing that we are trying to also address by uh, trying to think how can we help tourists and visitors to get along better without so many tensions, to try to understand each other better. Um, and basically you can see here the slide about respecting, maybe you can't see it, it says respect our sex workers because they're people, they're not objects. So the aim of cult sense is exactly to develop tools to try to sensitize young travelers, but also future professionals like yourselves here today. So we want to help you to become better professional, more aware, more culturally aware, so that you can also uh, have better practices in the future when you are in the field and working in the field. So we are five universities uh, and two associate partners, two networks. One is Atlas and the other one is Wise Travel Confederation. And we have tried to work already for two years in this project, developing different uh, tools. So we tried to uh, create an educational approach that also when you are studying, uh, your teachers, your organizations also can follow. Uh, also trying to get tools that you can use and, and also uh, tools in terms of thinking, awareness, and skills that you can uh, improve. And we also aim not just tourism programs, but also culture, leisure. And we hope that we can also include other programs and extend to other programs because these days anybody can be a tourist. <clears throat> so what are these tools that I'm talking about? We've, we've developed and we are still developing quite a few uh, things like videos that are very popular among students. 
in fact, if you want, you can help us to create more videos about cultural understanding. Maybe you would like to share your experiences. So that would be great. Please get in touch. Um, we, have, we have done also some learning modules that you can use in your classroom, that teachers can use in the classroom also. Um, and today we will present the case studies. So we have produced uh, an ebook that we have printed, I think it's circulating that you can also see, with eight case studies about uh, specific things related to cultural sensitivity and cultural sensitive practices. But what is this thing about cultural sensitivity? Cultural sensitivity is a skill, we believe it's also a competence that we can develop so we can all become more culturally uh, sensitive people. And uh, it, it comes in the, in, in the avenue and follows this idea of responsible tourism, of ethic tourism, of mindful tourism. This idea that we need to understand where we are and uh, understand better the context, the people that are there. So it's in this sense that um, we also develop academic uh, research, but we also do other things and we invite our students and other students. Again, I invite you to participate in our project, for example, with Instagram uh, or with LinkedIn. Again, the, the case study you can see there uh, uh, on the right hand side, uh, the cover, we have different types of videos and <clears throat> many of them also made with students. So it's quite, it's quite nice to see all of this reflection and thinking going on. We also have these five learning uh, modules that you can also take a look and, and if there's a specific topic that you really like, uh, uh, you can even ask your teachers to, to, to do it in your class. But moving on to the case study, which is what brings us today, just in brief, our, our case studies are um, on creating cultural understanding through travel. So it's really thinking in the tourism context and mobility context, also considering, for example, mobilities like Erasmus mobility. Some of you Erasmus students? Oh, nice. Oh, very nice. So I hope you are enjoying your Erasmus mobility. It was the best thing I could ever done in my studies was an Erasmus mobility. I still think about it all these years. I know I'm very young, but uh, yes, it's, uh, it's still very, uh, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a very important experience. So welcome. In these case studies, we have four uh, topics. The first one is emotion emotions, culture, and tourism. Because sometimes we talk about hospitality, we talk about management, we talk about uh, uh, organizing a trip, booking a ticket, and those kind of things. But there's a lot, I mean, it's not that that makes us travel. There's a lot of emotions in terms of the motivations, but also when you get there. And it can also be some conflicts sometimes or some tensions. Uh, between what you can do and not. And for example, here you have a case on uh, Auschwitz, uh, visiting Auschwitz as a concentration camp, which can be quite different if you are a veteran, for example, or if you are related to the families of the victims, or if you're just a young student who barely knows about uh, the Holocaust. Um, there's also one on the Amsterdam, uh, the Wallen, the red light, right, uh, red light district, and also the tensions that I was introducing you uh, with. Oh yeah, here are the pictures, by the way. Uh, I, if you are curious, please talk to me after or ask some questions about some of these cases and some of these pictures, um, because it can be quite uh, nice also if you're curious or if you have experiences yourself. The tastes of culture, the name is in the taste, the secret, it's not a big secret because it, it reveals itself. It's about tasting, it's about 
gastronomy, gastronomic experiences. So how food, culinary and gastronomy uh, can help us to understand and that we shouldn't understand not just eat, we should try to understand a bit more than just saying, oh, it's great. Uh, maybe understand why and where it comes from. There are two cases, one from, anybody recognize the picture at the bottom there? One guess. Sahabulu, yes, so it's the uh, one of the dishes in Ming, one of the traditional dishes, Sahabulu. And we have a video and we have also a case study. And we also have uh, a very interesting study on Catalan gastronomy and the perceptions on Catalan gastronomy. Like when you look into people who come from Catalonia and foreigners, you see the embutit, do I say it correctly, is uh, um, there's a big difference between who knows one and why is it important and not. The third one is uh, spirituality in sacred places. And um, here is thinking about spirituality in a very open way. It can be religious, but it can also be uh, rituals or things that you do and you might not consider it spiritual, but it might be. Those things that you do sometimes that you think they're nearly sacred for you. And sometimes you don't even question it. Um, and we will have, uh, we have a case on religious tourism. Is that what you will present, Sylvia? Uh, religious tourism, but also we have things that are not really religious, but are kind of sacred nearly, which is the Finnish sauna. Who has done Finnish sauna or a sauna experience? Not so many. Uh, after Peter's talk, you will want to do it. You will see. And the, four, uh, the fourth chapter, the fourth section in our, uh, in our ebook is engaging with local cultures. So we can visit and we can visit, for example, with our friends, a place, and we go there, we do a few things, we visit a few attractions and we come home. And then we think, oh, I, don't, I didn't really talk to many people, maybe the waiter in the restaurant or you know, maybe the person serving a coffee. So trying to engage with locals and trying to talk to locals and see if you can learn and exchange because they can also learn from you. And it's quite important, this interaction. So here we have, look at that nice picture there, Erasmus, uh, Erasmus students in, uh, mobility students in Vienna, do Castello. Um, and we have another beautiful picture of a uh, uh, fortified church in uh, Transylvania. So Transylvania, many of you associate with Dracula, but you can ask our wonderful colleagues from Romania, from Transylvania there, if they agree with you. There's much more to it. Isn't it Cosmin and Alin? Yes. So, um, also, you know, we have locals there from there here, so you can always exchange. And this is what we are uh, trying to, to do, and this is what we talk in our book. Um, the other thing in terms of your thinking and your learning process, uh, how does this really connect to tourism? What can we do when you are in the field? One of the ways to use this cultural sensitivity one of the ways to put in practice some of these things is through creative tourism. So the notion of creative tourism, some of you might be more familiar than others, is this tourism that is much more, it's not mass tourism, it's done on a small scale and it's much more active and they have a learning component and a creative component. And this is where you put at the heart of the tourism experience, you put creativity, places, and people. So we try to bring them together. So I hope many of you will be inspired uh, by this because we can do a lot together also with colleagues. Um, you can also do internships with us. You can volunteer. You can send us some of your pictures, share some of your experiences. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, on LinkedIn, etc. Um, and 
this is my main message that let's be more culturally sensitive. Let's be better professionals. Let's be better tourists. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I cannot say a word in Portuguese, but yeah, hola, yes. <laughs> Oh, as well. So, so, obrigada for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, as Lenia has introduced already, what I'm going to present you is a case study. The title is Filling Religious Sites in Tourism. Lenia mentioned it was about religious tourism. Well, we'll see if it's religious tourism or if it's tourism in religious sites, but it's not exactly the same. So, we'll see. The starting point for our case study, in fact, uh, was during a field trip, a visit with our students in Barcelona. As it was mentioned, I come from Girona. Girona is in the north of Spain. Is probably you heard about Barcelona. So Girona is like mm, two hours, 40 minutes with a fast train from Barcelona. So we went there for a visit with our, to, with our students and we visit La Sagrada Familia. And visiting La Sagrada Familia, um, I realized that there were different experiences there and different perceptions of there. So we had one of our students who is co-author of, of this chapter, of this case study, Guillerme, that was very impressed about the, about the visit and about the place. It was, it's an amazing place. But then we had the Chinese student also being with us and she was like, yeah, it's okay. And then, okay, I started to sing. Okay, something is happening. A few weeks later after the visit in, in La Sagrada Familia, we went to visit another place, another site, which is uh, Monastita Poblet. Uh, before I taught someone close by Poblet, so you, you know about it. So this is a world hated site. I will refer later to the, to the place. And again, the experience for the different students was different. So you have here part of the, of the text of, of what happened there. We had the opportunity to go and to attend the last prayer of the monks, the, the evening prayer of the monks. So uh, in this case, Guillermo was very excited about having the opportunity to go there. But some of the colleagues just decided to leave the church before the end of the prayer. And this was something that for some of the students was, let's say, shocking. So some of them found that this was a disrespectful attitude, but others thought that, no, it was boring. So it was okay, we just stand up and, and left the place. So here we started to say, okay, here we, we should do something or at least is we should try to understand what's happening here. For sure, it's not only about our students, for sure it happens with many visitors that sometimes they visit places and they don't really understand the place or they don't really feel the place. So we started with these three questions. How can sacred sites be presented to tourists or be explained to tourists without losing their meaning? Because in fact, if, if we lose the meaning, not only of religious sites, but in general, of, of the places we visit, maybe they became like thematic parks or places with no sense. The other question is how these religious sites can offer different experiences. And you will see that each of the sites that we analyzed, in fact, are offering different, different experiences. They are not all religious experiences and they try to satisfy different visitors. You will see that the perception is not always the same. So this is mainly the, the point. And also how can values in religious sites can be presented as we mentioned before. So you will see. 
so we started and you will find these in the case study. So I'm not going to just uh, develop this long, but uh, we started to think what's happening in, in religious sites around the world. The three places that we selected for Catalonia are three sites that they have two characteristics. They are religious sites and they are in the list of World Heritage Sites of the UNESCO. So, and this is not something that is casual. So many World Heritage Sites in the world are related to religion or to spirituality, around 20%. So you can see that it's quite a lot, let's say. Many of them are connected not only with cathedrals or religious sites, but also to nature, to cultural landscapes, and also itineraries. We are very close here no, to the San Camino de Santiago. So for example, this is another, another place and another site that it's also inscribed in the list. So this is the idea. And the main point of our research is based on a book that was published long time, long time ago in 2000, 2001 from Shackley that says that every place has a spirit. So, and that spirit of the place, it's important to try to maintain this original function and this meaning of the sites. So in religious sites, it happened many things, but we have many people visiting the sites for different purposes. Um, you will see like the case study that it's not only about religious tourism, as I mentioned, we have cultural tourists, we have spiritual tourists also, and we might have other visitors that go there for different motivations. So if, if you are interested in knowing more, you can find also in the book some references that you can check and how we explore this or how we approach this. So the aim you already know. So what we did is to try to compare three different sites in Catalonia. So what we did was to analyze the management tools of the sites to do non-participant observation. So to go there and just observe the visitors and keep track of, of what we were observing, of, of the different attitudes and behaviors that they were ha having there. And also we analyzed the comments on social networks after the visit to know, about, to know more about the experience. So the three sites that were analyzed were Poblet, which is in Tarragona. I'm not sure if you're going to see here. No, it doesn't work. So I cannot move, right? Okay, so Poulet is the, the one that you have, you see two different, two, um, two red balloons here. So the, the one that's just middle is Poulet. Then this one here is Barcelona. So in Barcelona, you have different sites. One is La Sagrada Familia, but you have all the, the different houses from Gaudí. And then the other one is up to the Pyrenees, so it's the one that is more in the north and it's in the inland, is close to the French border. And it's, um, it's a Romanic, Romanesque church named uh, San Clement de Tabull. So you will see some pictures. Let's start with Poblet. So this is, uh, as I said, the monastery of Poblet. Here it's quite close to Tarragona. So this is another important city in Catalonia. You can see it's, it's a monastery and there's nothing else around. So there are some small villages. There are some, yeah, there are some winers around. So it's mainly um, a quiet place. So if we see what some key elements that, that we saw, you can see that they receive around 100,000 visitors per year. This was before the pandemic. So we went back this year and they, will have more or less the same amount of visitors at, at the end of the year. So the management is private. There is a monk community living there. So it's the monk community that manages the, the, the place, the site. They offer different activities. They have guided tours. They have accommodation that was closed during the pandemic and now they are trying to reopen, but it's not easy. Of course, they offer the religious activities, but they have also other activities like concerts, or like uh, different, let's say, you know, activities more for tourists. And they have an interpretation center, which is quite interesting because in, before you enter the monastery, you can go and visit the interpretation center. So there you just learn a bit more about, about the place. So if we analyze what's on the social, this is updated. So this was from 
uh, yeah, let's say two weeks ago, so it's quite updated. So you can see that they have uh, a good evaluation. The main comments of visitors there is that you can see it's a masterpiece, it's worth visiting it, it's a mystic place, it's a unique experience, a magnificent monastery. They say that the guided tour is excellent, for example. The, the, some comments refer to the level of conservation. They say that it's very well preserved. If we analyze the pictures, most of them are similar to the one you have seen at the beginning. So with the monastery and the vineyards. But then if we analyze the comments in general, yeah, the main comments are positive, but there are some of them that are not that good. And mainly they refer to one thing, that is the entrance fee. So I say that the price of admission is abusive. It's all about pay, pay, pay. Um, if you do the visit in the afternoon, for example, you don't have the possibility of a guided tour. So yeah, some comments. So after we observe the visitors and we analyze, we perceive that most of the visitors, remember that it's only, only about 100,000 visitors, but they were happy with the visit. Normally, some of them complain because of the price, but it's okay. And they perceive the site as a quiet place. Re remember, mystic place, beautiful. So it's different, for example, of what we found in other places. The next site that we visit and that we analyze is Val de Bui. This is even more remote. It's, it's far from every place here. From Barcelona, you need like more than four hours driving to reach the place. There are no public transport. So you need to reach the, this site. So here you have two pictures. One is from, as you can see, outside. And the other one is inside. You're seeing inside, it's not real. This is a video projection, okay? So the story here of the site is that they find uh, the picture, these paintings, they are fresco paintings uh, from the medieval period, but in order to preserve, to preserve them, they remove the paintings and the original paintings are stored in a museum in Barcelona. So you can go in Barcelona and visit the, and, and see the paintings. But then if you go there, what you're going to see when you enter the church is the empty church. But then they did a recreation, a digital recreation in 2010. So they did this recreation. So you can just have this audiovisual projection that lasts for five minutes. And you see the process of painting. So you start with nothing and then you start just seeing how it's painted with music. So it's a very interesting experience as well. So again, if we compare data here, they have less visitors, so 60 thousand visitors. This is managed by a public consortium because since the World Heritage Site Declaration, uh, they had this, this consortium together with the church. You can see the price here. So if you just want to enter this church is five euros. If you go to enter different churches in the area, you can have this combined, combined ticket. And then the services are religious activities, this video projection and guided tours. So what happens here? to guess what do you think what do you think people are happy not happy visitors do you think they complain they complain of something any idea they complain we all complain about something <laughs> and the most of the comments as you can see here are positive and in general people tend to be happy with the visit again visiting it is the only of the three sites sites that in the comments it's mentioned that it's a world hated site. While all the three are world hated site, this is the only one that is mentioned. Uh, but here in the main comments, again, is the price. They also mention about the environment and most of the pictures that are there with, with the hashtag Valdebui and so is are similar to the ones that I presented already. Again, the main complaint, the price the price and here you have the guided tour and then the other thing that it was not in the case of Kublet for example they were complaining about finding a ticket office when you enter a church so in this case you have to pay for entering the church 
Remember that the monastery also had a church, but in this case, it was not mentioned. And in fact, in the monastery, you can enter the church freely. It's only for visiting the cloister and monastery, but not the church. So it's, it's mentioned again. So in general, with the observation, again, people is happy, but for example, here there are no locals. We, during our observation, we didn't find locals in, in the church. We found mainly visitors, mainly coming from Barcelona, in the area of Barcelona, and some French visitors as well. But locals were in other places, not here. And let's go with our last place. This is Sagrada Familia. So probably you've heard all about Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. In fact, it's uh, one of the most visited sites in Barcelona, if not the most visited. So here you have some pictures, one also from outside, another one from inside. So let's just, in terms of management again. So before the pandemic, they received uh, 4 million visitors per year. So it was the most visited site in Barcelona, followed by other places like um, Camp Nou and like other Gaudí buildings and so on. Um, I checked with the tourist office two weeks ago, and they mentioned that still this year was the, when, when people go to the tourist office in Barcelona, what they ask the most is about visiting La Sagrada Familia. So we'll see at the end of the year if they reach this amount of visitors or not. But you can see that and you realize the number of visitors, if you consider also that it's, again, uh, in this case, no, a religious site. It's managed by a private foundation. So it's, the management is different in every, in, in each case. We have, a, a in this case, a private foundation, a religious order in the first case, and a public consortium in the second one. See the price, 26 euros. So can you imagine if we complain for paying five euros to enter one church? Now with a guided tour, 30 euros, with the audio guide, 26 euros, okay? Apart from this, they offer guided tours, religious activities. We did an interview with the managers and the managers said that they were very keen of trying to organize activities for local people, especially for people living in the neighborhood. But it's really hard, they mentioned, to bring people to these activities because people tend to just go and do other things in other places because sometimes, yeah, it's, it's really, really, the, the place is really busy. So let's go about the visitor experience and the comments. So note, that, note please that here it's the one that has the best score if we consider only the numbers. So it's the, the first one was 4.5, the second one 4.6, this one is 4.7, okay? The comments, wonderful, astonishing, breathtaking. If you have visited the place, you can understand why, because really it's an amazing place in terms of if, if you enter with uh, all the, um, the lights, and uh, it's really impressive. Um, most of the visitors recommend to take or the audio guides or to do the guided tour. This is very important because if we go back to our main questions at the beginning, what we're going to see is that uh, if you don't get any information, it's very hard to understand what you're seeing. Gaudí as an architecture was very symbolic. So everything that you're seeing there has a meaning. But if nobody told you, you may say, yeah, it's nice, it's beautiful, but that's all, okay? Comments, again, on the entrance fee, of course, because if we complain for five euros, we're going to complain for 26. But here also the booking procedure. So you cannot go there and, and buy the ticket in the entrance. You have to book it in advance and you have to book it through a platform. And the flat platform sometimes is not working, is not easy going, is not so, it's quite hard and people complain about this. So sometimes they go to the tourist office to, to ask for support to buy the tickets for visiting La Sagrada Familia, which is also quite common. Another interesting thing, if we compare, 
pictures. If in Instagram, for example, pictures, you can find the pictures, as I mentioned, from inside and from outside. But also, if you look for the hashtag Sagrada Familia, you're going to find local dishes and restaurants that put the hashtag close to Sagrada Familia in order to yeah, make advertising <laughs> for them. And also, for example, different companies, religious organizations that use also the hashtag to promote themselves. So it's not only about the building, but many other things. So as it's very well known, many people are looking for this. So also they try to make, let's say, business with this. And some of the comments. And here you can imagine that with this such amount of, of comments, it's hard to say, yeah, oh, these are the comments. But for example, some that were, at least for me, quite surprising. What's a disappointment? Permanent work that spoils the visit. More than exorbitant prices. Difficult to reserve tickets. Nothing exceptional, therefore the contrary. So, no, it's... There are many other comments that say that it's very war, it's it's worth visiting, but also there are comments that say no. So it was very hard to manage. And then less than I expected. Any church or cathedral in Europe is more beautiful. It's a personal opinion. So um, and when observing people here, what what we noticed? We noticed that um, and we spoke with some of the visitors. So those that were there because they love architecture, they love, they were happy with the visit. They were very happy with the audio guide. Okay, the works is okay, but because they could enjoy also the visit. But for example, those that were willing to visit the church, they were not happy with the visit because they felt that they were paying a lot of money for visiting a church. They felt that they could not have a place to just sit and stay there for a moment with silence because many people were walking around the work also, you know, the noise of the works that are, because, you know, it's not finished. So even they try to organize the visit, even they try to sell tickets in different moments, it's hard to manage all these experiences. So the conclusion, and this is the end of, of the presentation, is that uh, we should try to reflect more on how these religious sites can be used as places that can promote different values because all the places have different values. You have seen, for example, that in some places nature was mentioned, architecture, but also you know, the fact that it's a world heritage site. And sometimes it's not used by managers because they offer only one story. So we should try to promote different narratives about the place to try to reach different visitors. The other thing is that normally in all these places, visits tend to focus on cultural values and aesthetic values, but don't go deep into the meaning of the place. So this is interesting, even if you are not religious. I mean, to understand the place and to understand why it's there or because it's there or because they do this or that, it's interesting. So for visitors, it's also a way of learning and learning about local people. The only place where visitors could meet local people was in Poblet, because the church was open for free and their visitors could meet local people that would go there. So this is also interesting. If you want to meet locals sometimes, you know, and, and not locals at the reception of the hotel, this is also interesting. So what we thought is that managers are losing opportunities. And as future professionals of tourism, you or our professional of tourism, we all, we should consider also how to engage people and not to lose opportunities. So thank you very much. You can have the case study. So if you want more information, just check it. Thank you. Just in case I get excited, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, you can hear me. Okay, so if I run away from the microphone or something, then it's okay. Just checking. Just I'm sorry. Yeah, it's here. No problem. Yes. Uh, it's down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it should be down there somewhere hidden. Yes. Let's see. It's. it's Mm. Let's see. Is it? Do I find it here? Is it? Is it? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. 
So we begin with a picture. Yes, we begin. Let's see. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, yeah, I can't make it into a presentation here, but let's see. Let's see. It's even. It's even more difficult in in in, in Portuguese. Yeah, my, my Portuguese is not. Yeah, it didn't work. The, the icon there, or I didn't succeed in trying to so, uh, Yes, hello. I'm uh, Peter. You Peter Björk from, uh, from Finland. From Finland, Peter Björk Goretti here made a good effort in learning my last name. Uh, you can see it's spelled there, so it's not so easy. Anyway, uh, our case study was called then uh, culture um, of sand, and and that might might uh, uh, need a bit of explanation. So so uh, anyway, it's from a poem there, um, William Blake, to see the world uh, in a grain of sand. So uh, you know, if you have a grain of sand, how big was the mountain where it came from? Who was on that mountain, and so on. What what uh, what have that uh, grain of sand seen before? So that's the sort of the idea with this. Because uh, I'm, I'm trying. What I'm trying to do here is is to have a look at Finnish sauna bathing. Yes, but uh, in a sense, what can we see in sauna? And and what what we more will have a look at today is the second one, basically here yeah, that. Uh, what do Finns, when we go into a sauna, what do we sort of take with us there? So sauna is um, um, not only a, a, a hot place, but it's, it, it becomes something else when we go into it. So, so that's basically what I'm, I'm going to try to show you and uh, give you a, an experience. Okay, so it's a, a intangible heritage. Yeah, I was counting there. Sauna in Finland have, uh, I think, maybe if we have, uh, let's say, uh, so let's say, three million saunas or something like that, and, and five million people. So annual visitors, maybe once a week. So I don't know. Do the mathematics there. Three times. So yeah, let's say a uh, 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 hundred million visitors a year. Then so uh, right. Um, I'm trying also to connect a bit to theory here, and it's about this uh, uh, you tourism students, you, you and professionals, professionals know about this, uh, uh, we, about authenticity and staged authenticity. So I'm trying a bit to connect to that. That's anyway a uh, 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 kind of uh, inspiration, if, if nothing else. So uh, we will look at the grains of sand. It's not the best illustration. That's Bermuda pink sand. I, I Google told me so. So we are going to look at a few grains of sand then and and zoom in, zoom out from the sand. Um, slightly kind of a social constructivist view here. So so uh, that's also the sort of the rays they're going in and out from the sound from the sand. But um, but it's it's a sense I think we are Finns, so we build a sauna wherever we go, and and because we have that sauna and because we talk about sauna, we are Finns. So so it, it sort of works the both ways, social constructivism, and uh, uh, sauna is present in our lives every day from uh, from birth to death. That it used to be more literally speaking this birth to death and, and I'll come back to that in a second here so uh, Finnish government's official web page um, press release this is 2015 but anyway um, so the prime minister visited United Nations soldiers Finnish soldiers in in uh, Lebanon maybe uh, and in the Press release from the Finnish government, they tell that the Finnish Prime Minister, Mr. Sipila, then inaugurated a Finnish sauna for the battalion. So, so this, I think this, I mean, yeah, it's a bit, but I think it shows that it's something special with this sauna thing. Uh, 
uh, I don't see, for example, now I hope I get it right, Antonio Costa. I don't see him, you know, inaugurating 15 showers for Portuguese uh, soldiers somewhere. So it wouldn't happen. So, so, so it's a bit strange this, and, and, and why is it? Well, maybe it was a bit in the previous slide there that because we are Finns, we build a sauna. I have had a sauna at the Finnish embassy in New Delhi, in, in India, 40 degrees warm outside. So why do you need a sauna? Well, that was at the embassy. So um, anyways, uh, 5 million people, 3 million saunas. The saunas can be found a bit everywhere uh, on top uh, in, in high rises, uh, by the lake, of course, in gymnasiums and so on. So, uh, so saunas are everywhere, also in the, the House of Parliament, uh, the, 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 the parliamentarians obviously like to have a sauna every now and then in the heated discussions. But maybe more from the, I don't know, uh, and this is, that's why imaginary, whether this is an imaginary construct, this sauna, is this no, question goes a bit like, is this now staged for authenticity? I mean, this is what you, tourists, when you come to Finland, not if, but when you come to Finland as tourists, you will run into sauna somewhere and you will be introduced to sauna. And the one down on the right, that's in, in Helsinki, one of the more modern, or most modern, I should say, uh, uh, centers for sauna bathing. But, but the, the one, the White House you see there, that's from my, or in, 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 in Turku, my hometown there, um, so uh, where also Novia University is that, that I come from. So you can hire this house. It's a sauna and you can have a sauna. The photos of the guy there going down into the sea through the floor in the sauna is, is in that particular sauna raft. So, uh, and, and you can have, um, you have a, a waiter there, of course, serving you refreshments as it's called. And uh, well, you can see what it's about. It's, it's carnival, uh, it's fun. Uh, so, um, and also then this is uh, slightly older, but this is also in Turku, uh, Turku Finland, then my, my surroundings. And um, during the, the capital of culture in, in 2011, they were created kind of artistic saunas by artists then in, in the town. And uh, uh, let's see, these are, are, all of these are saunas, but um, slightly strange maybe. So the one in the middle, of course, you can see through it. So it's, you know, it, it's not private in any way. There was a football team, I think, having a sauna there in, inside when it was opened. You have an onion shaped sauna. You have the cube. You have the cube there on the river. So uh, those of you called Sensians who were in Turku, you recognize the river. And uh, also in this summer, it was possible to go to the sea then through, through the, the, the floor there. Uh, the one there up on the left is, is a sauna obscura. So the, if you know a camera obscura, in other words, a room which, which works like a camera. Are you familiar with this? If not, uh, there is one in Edinburgh, very famous camera obscura. Uh, so, you know, in a camera, there is this room where the picture is sort of, where the reality is taken in. So, so this works the same way. And, and you can see the boat in the roof of the sauna there. So you, this was also floating. So you had to row out to the sauna and then you were inside a camera there and you could view what was going on outside. So. Uh, so this is a, a, a different, yeah, the interior is from the onion, by the way. So, so different kinds of saunas, uh, this is the more carnivalistic side, I should say. But, uh, but then if you go into the more ordinary life, so from staged authenticity, if you take a few steps back, you may see something like this. On the left, you see my sauna, very important. On the right hand side, you see uh, the cults and sauna. So that's the 
that's the project sauna we had in, in uh, during the meeting in Finland. And, and, and that's a, please have a look at that picture because you will see something similar to it, I hope, in a, sec in a, in a while. So we are moving to move towards maybe more authentic. But my question is then that what is authentic or not? Uh, anyway, uh, before that, we move into the, remember I tried to say that sauna is with us every day, every day. And, and uh, uh, so these guys, do, does anyone recognize anyone here on the, on the photos? These are world famous guys. You wouldn't believe it, but, but they are. Uh, the guy there, the man, that's the, our president, Mr. Sauli Niinistä. So he is now, you know, there discussing with NATO and so on. And there he is having a sauna on live, live, send, uh, live uh, on TV. Um, so uh, um, this is, he was not president then, but still. And, and there on the, on the right hand side, it's, this is a TV show, a political TV show where politicians were interviewed by these two guys then sitting there uh, about anything. Uh, it was humorous and so on, but, but uh, serious as well. Uh, the, 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 the lady there on the right, she's the former president of Finland, Tarja Halonen. So, uh, so, so, well, with this picture, maybe I want to show that even the president, or at the time, then I think she was maybe the foreign minister or, or, or secretary of state then, so, so uh, uh, even a, a, a prominent politician can undress and go into the sauna with men, and and uh, you know, of course she was, of course, wearing a towel. We are not barbarians, so. Uh, uh, but it's possible, you know, and no one thinks more about it. So people in their living rooms were watching, watching her there, listening to her in the sauna. And um, anyways, um, it gets a bit more boring here now. I'm sorry. Uh, less fantastic pictures maybe but um, just to show again how this is from my email very it could be last week or two weeks ago uh, and, and uh, you recognize maybe two words here sauna and sauna so uh, but the rest of course is finished uh, this is this is the uh, teachers union arranging something called a sauna forum forum you recognize so what this is, is that, that the director or the, the head of the union invites people to discuss online. And, and these events are called sauna events, um, symbolizing what we usually understand that when you go to a sauna, you relax and you discuss more openly than in a dinner. So, so, so also here you use the symbolism of, of sort of sauna. Um, the same idea maybe in the in the TV program then with the with the uh, presidents. Okay, but from birth to death, uh, I just wanted to show the the text. There is not important. It, it says that that uh, uh, up to this century, the sauna was widely used as a place for childbirth. So, uh, and this century, this was written in 1988. So. So up to the beginning of the 1900s. Um, so that was the birth. On the right hand side, you have the washing of the body. Uh, uh, so of course not in a sauna, but I couldn't find a picture of anyone washing a body in a sauna. I'm sorry, it's, it's not on Google. So, so uh, yes, but that's, you know, from birth to death. And this is still very much present in our lives today. The uh, girl there with the orange dot uh, is my, my uh, children's grandmother. Uh, she is still alive to, today. She was born in the 30s and, and she was the first of all these kids who was allowed to be given birth to in the house. The rest, the older kids, they were, you know, they were born in the sauna. So, so, uh, um, so this is, you know, uh, I don't know why it happened there between the, the, the rest of the kids and her. what did they get a, I don't know, a new, new something bed or something. I don't know what's happened there, but, but anyway, 
So maybe they read in the newspaper that it's nice or, or something. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, this, by the way, is in, 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 in a part of Finland that, that she had to leave uh, because the Soviet Union took, took the house and took the area there, so they moved the border. So, yes. Uh, okay, but now uh, this is what I wanted you to have a look, why I wanted you to have a look at the pulse and sauna. So on the left there, you see something, I think, similar to the sauna we had. So on the right, you see the fire. Yes, it's open now, the fireplace. But then up there, there was, you know, Cosme, Goretti, Silvia, they were up there. And uh, Edgar wasn't there. So uh, uh, they were up there and, and they were, you know, not really a possibility to wash yourselves down there, but, but it's still the same sort of, um, um, and it's a smoke sauna. It means that there is no chimney, the, the smoke doesn't, go out the ordinary way, but it's more like in the picture on the right, the, the smoke comes out from the windows and, and uh, uh, that's not smoke there, that's, that's uh, uh, whatever it's called, when you are warm and it's cold outside. So, uh, um, so um, but anyhow, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the picture on the right, by the way, also kind of explains why do have to give birth in the sauna. Well, the, sim the simple kind of explanation is that that's where you have warm water, hot water. So, I mean, it's easy for you here in Portugal to say that, well, you can go anywhere and give birth, you know, but when it's minus 20 degrees outside and you, and you, you have to go to a lake you know, with your ax and hit a, and cut a hole in the ice and, and carry the water into the sauna and heat it, then, you know, it's totally different business. So, uh, um, so in the winter, especially, it was no sort of a walk in the park to give birth. Axel um, Egal and Kaleva, by the way, a very famous Finnish painter, national romanticism at that, that time, before Finland became uh, independent then. And uh, also, you know, on the right hand there, you have this called smoke, a smoke house. So, so if this is how people live, you know, uh, then you rather go to the sauna and give birth, I'm sure. Um, so um, the sauna was all, you had the hot water and so on, but, but it was also the place where you, uh, I mean, if you wash a dead body, for example, you wouldn't like that water in your kitchen. So, you know, it's a practical in a sense. So, yes, okay. Uh, now, now uh, let's see, what do I, how much do I have time? Maybe a few minutes, maybe a few minutes, yes, because, uh, uh, well, this was, this, so far, um, this is what we kind of have with us when we go into a sauna. Everything, every, this, everything, this is kind of our heritage. We know these stories. We know that Granny was the first one who was not born in a sauna. So, so we kind of take them with us there, so, so uh, um, I don't know about this authenticity. If it's something that can be visible or would it be, I mean, would it be more authentic for you guys to have a sauna if it looked like this? I don't think so. That's not the thing really with it. So, so uh, um, it, it's the stories that we bring in there that makes the, the uh, uh, experience authentic, I believe. So um, it's kind of the mythology about, about uh, uh, sauna bathing. Um, I have a, a choice to make here now and, uh, and uh, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll use a few minutes then. Just to, again, to so, show how, how present it is. This, is. this is going towards economy as well here, and, and, but also the culture. So, so the, the newspaper here, technology and economy from the 2nd of September here this year, we were kind of planning this presentation when I happened to see this. Uh, and, and on the first page of this newspaper, this is for, for engineers and, and, uh, and uh, uh, business people, this, this newspaper. So on the first page, you have something about sauna. And of course, we had to include it here. Uh, and uh, it talks about this. So, so two important things here. 
the, the, the little sort of not so nice animals there on the left and, and then the invention there on the right. So this is not maybe a big thing, but, but uh, I don't know, during the first world war, for example, and the time between there, people died very much with, of something called typhus. And, and so typhus is spread by the guys up there to the left then, but lice, uh, or, or lice spread them. And, and the, the same problem then uh, was around in the second world war. So this is, uh, um, and uh, these lice there down on the left hand side caused a lot, lots of deaths among, among the, the soldiers then. So uh, something had, be, had to be done and what was done was created a sort of portable sauna. And, and what is kind of revolutionary is that usually the sauna was a pile of rocks, which was, you know, not so easy to move, but creating something like this here was, yeah, it was portable. You could move it and, and have it in, in different places. So, uh, and it works, the sauna works as, as then saving lives in that it kills the lice. Um, so they were strict, you know, first the, 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 there were rooms with soldier saunas. First day you undress, leave your clothes, then you go into sauna, then you have to sweat this and that long uh, while the clothes were put in another room also very hot for de-licing. And uh, then at the other end of this process, you could then uh, um, get back or probably change clothes into, into new sort of clothes. And so, uh, so it was very efficient. Uh, and, um, and this is with us really, because also the, the invention there was moved kind of the, the heating process made it different and, and that, that then uh, um, is now, how should I say, um, become a, a big industry. So, so a Finnish, you saw it there when the guy went down to the river for a swim, you saw the brand there, Haravia, but uh, so they, you know, they are, have, have offices and sales representatives in 80 countries, not in Portugal, you can give birth outside still. So, so uh, uh, not needed here, but uh, um, so it's still, you know, the whole business is living with us. And uh, so in a, what, 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 we, what we kind of, I don't know, this, this preparing for this also made me understand this UNESCO's intangible heritage better, that, that what is intangible, uh, uh, an intangible heritage. So uh, uh, I, think, I think maybe I, succeeded in telling this story about why, why sauna is uh, something, uh, an intangible heritage for us, us in Finland. And, but don't you worry, when you come to Finland and go to the sauna, the sauna will be finished, yes. And, and you know, it's authentic and it will be nice. That's the most important thing with saunas, uh, to have a pleasant, pleasant time there. And then you can think about all the, dirty and strange and lice and so on saunas that you don't have to visit, you know, so uh, the, the authentic ones. Yes, and that's the theory we do not want to have a look at, but uh, I should stop here now, but I should have stopped before this already. But we, Finns also, we try to, all the immigrants in Finland, for example, I tried to get into the sauna culture. So, so this is written in Somali. The, the, the sauna feet, sauna society spreads the, 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 the message of saunas in Somali so that also the, the we also have it in Arabic and, and other languages there on the web page. You can check it out, not in Portuguese, but, uh, uh, but anyways, yes. And no, <laughs> yeah, thank you. So thank you for being there. And I have to say, we also have a beautiful video made by the 
Finnish students from Novia that also includes them explaining what sauna is and how do they do it. So people, you know, a bit more of your age than uh, of our age. And a disclaimer, that picture that Peter said, that's the cult and sauna, there was one big difference. We did wear clothes. It was a choice. <laughs> Um, any questions, curiosities uh, for us, for the team? Also, uh, I don't know, people on Zoom. Um, questions, comments, maybe uh, sharing some experiences. Uh, we, one of the questions in the chat is where can we find the uh, case study presentation? Uh, the presentation, we might share it, but there's a lot of information. Everything related to cult sense is on www.cultsense.com. So you can find everything in our website, uh, including the case studies. And if you do need some extra information, uh, yeah, just feel free to contact us. There's no questions yet in the uh, chat, and that was the only one. Maybe any experiences that you would like to share or questions, or maybe you want to ask Peter how often he does sauna, <laughs> or, uh, or Sylvia, you know, how many uh, religious sites she visits and how much she prays in each one of them. You have a question? <laughs> yeah okay yeah i will repeat the question for those that are online but uh, yeah it's okay so alessandra is just asking if we had the chance to to ask the monks that are running the monastery of poblet about their feelings about having visitors there and and the impression about this yeah we spoke with the monks um and it's not only about money i'm not sure about crete and and what happened in crete i was in crete in 2021 also visiting some monasteries for also the same purpose but we didn't have the chance to speak with the monks there in crete but yes with the ones in catalonia uh they are um cistercians monasteries so they follow uh some benedictine rule so this rule says that they must welcome visitors. So it's part of their mission to welcome visitors in this case. So it's not only about money, but about opening the doors. That's why, for example, they still keep for free the entrance of the church. And what they do is that um, when you buy the ticket, so you can visit different places, but there are still some places that are the, the sites where they live that they are close to visit. And when it's uh, prayer time or the church is open, but the rest of the place is, is closed. So yeah, it's also about incomes of, of sure, but not only about this, but because they feel that they are like obliged to welcome people there. And since the declaration that is considered world heritage site, even more. 
thank you for the question because it's very interesting. Like right, 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 right. some of them do Yeah. In in this case, it's not a, it's a small community, and what I have to say is that not all the monks are exposed, let's say, to visitors. So, yeah, they, they said that there are different tasks. So the ones that are in charge of receiving visitors, they are there. The others are doing other tasks that are indoors, let's say. So, yeah, but still, yeah, you may feel that. You, you want some silence at some point, yeah. Thank you. So there's been a challenge here in the audience trying to get some of the students to share their experiences. Everybody's very shy. We do have somebody sharing their experience in, uh, in the online. You might not be able to read it, so I'll read it out loud. So Juana was also one of our interns and she just graduated last year from uh, the University of Sibiu, Lucian Blaga University, Sibiu. How do you say it in Romanian? It's Sibiu. <laughs> there we go. Yes, Juana, great. So she's saying she moved to Venlo in the Netherlands. Um, and she can say that it's an interesting and wonderful experience that is very different from her own city in Sibiu. It does take time to adapt to the new environment and the new language. So I, I suppose that some of you at least recognize that also, that it's different. Okay, yeah, okay, uh, I, it was this year, <laughs> my mistake. <laughs> Congrats, by the way. Um, I, I would like maybe to ask Peter, since there's no questions in the audience, uh, not so much how many times he goes to the sauna, but maybe what does the sauna mean to you and what do people do in the sauna? Why is it important? First of all, it's to relax. Uh, and uh, it's also a tra transition. I think we write about this, that uh, formerly people had saunas Friday night or, or back in the days when we still had a six day work week on Saturday night. And, and so the sauna signifies kind of moving from work to leisure. And, uh, so it, it's both uh, 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 like a ritual. You move from, from, you are dirty from work and then you go to the sauna and then you are clean and then you are, are ready for um, socializing and, and so on. And, and also parties like, uh, I think things are changing now. I must say my kids don't party in the same way as we did. Uh, Thank God. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but so so move, so so things. But, but we could do like this: that we went somewhere, we had a sauna, and then we ate together and, and uh, yeah, had dinner together. Does it involve alcohol? So, <laughs> yes, yes, it could. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But here you could, you know, you could you can have. We have bars where you have a sauna, so you can go. You can be in the bar and you have a, a you know sauna and bars at the same time yes so so it's yeah that that would be the transition from from work to leisure to relax yeah a change of mood mood setter yes thank you 
Thank you. I see some discussions in the audience. Would you like to share some thoughts? Oh, and then everybody went silent suddenly. <laughs> They're hungry. They're hungry. So uh, I don't know, would you like to oh. say some words or we? Okay, so um, shall I close? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I just have to, on behalf of Cult Sense, I would like to uh, thank EPP for hosting us here. And also thanks to our audience. Thanks for the people who came from all the way from Vienna. Thank you for the Zoom uh, colleagues and students. Thank you for being there. And I invite all of you to act with cult sense and to keep cult sense in your lives and you know our principles our values also in your heart and in your jobs in the future jobs and um for the ones here you are also entitled to tea coffee uh and a little reception that we will have now so thank you all and have a good uh cult sense for the rest of your lives thank you.